Okay. Good day. My name is Espen Eller, and it is a pleasure for me to present this uh, lecture on weed-dependent exercise-induced anaphylaxis. I'm based in Denmark, Northern Europe, in the city of Odense, where I am hosting this event, and it is a pleasure for me to talk. I work as a scientific advisor for Thermo Fisher Scientific, but besides that, I have an extensive academic career, both in the National Danish Society, but also in the European Academy of Allergy and Clinical Immunology. Food-dependent exercise is due to anaphylaxis covers a lot of different uh, allergens. Uh, wheat is only one of them. Normally we call it uh, food-dependent exercise to do anaphylaxis, but in relation to wheat, we have used the term wheat-dependent exercise to do anaphylaxis. But it's not only exercise that we will cover here. We will also cover other cofactors or augmenting factors like alcohol and aspirin. Basically, the concept is that a patient can have either wheat or any of these cofactors separately without any issues. But if these are combined, the patient is in risk of having an anaphylaxis shock. If we look on all gluten and wheat related disorders, they are defined by the autoimmune part in this group here, where we have celiac disease as the most common one. We also have the non-specific gluten sensitivity in the other part. And in the middle here, we have allergic IgE mediated uh, disorders, wheat allergy, which can manifest either as respiratory allergy in Baker's asthma, traditional food allergy that is seen in, in children, for example. We have the Widaya, wheat dependent exercise induced anaphylaxis that we will cover today and contact urticaria, usually in relation with hydrolyzed wheat products. Wheat itself is a very complex allergen. If you look on wheat, it has six times more bears, base pairs than human. It is hexaploid. It has 15 times more genes. So it's very, very complex to work, work with. If we look at it on a botanical point of view, we have the classical bread wheat, which all are, uh, appears from the uh, ancestor of Emma, which is in family with rye and barley. We also have oat, a little bit further distance compared to wheat. And then we have other uh, grass related um, types of foods like maize, millet and rice, which all belongs to the grass family. So the big question is here is what can components and serology do to help you in the diagnostic workup? Well, if you look on other allergen systems like milk, for example, you will see a very, very nice correlation between the specific IgE for, weak, for, for milk for an individual patient and the sum of all components. So if you add the sum of a patient's components for milk up, it will nicely fit the value of the specific ID for milk because all the uh, components are water soluble. They are all present, meaning that we are not missing any variables. If you look on peanut, for example, you see a little bit more scattered picture. That's because we still miss some allergens. There are still some components that we are not able to, me to measure. And that, of course, makes the difference between the specific ID to peanut and the sum of all the components a little bit more scared. On wheat, the picture is even worse. And that is because wheat allergens and some of them are water insoluble. And that is important if you look on the way that they are extracted. Here we have an overview of uh, all the proteins in, in wheat. A wheat kernel consists of the majority is starch. And then you have a fraction of proteins. And these proteins can then be divided either into water soluble parts, the globulins and the albumins, and water insoluble that is what we call the prolamines, the glutens. And when you extract wheat, basically you mix it with water and you have all the allergens here that are water soluble. But that means that when what is added to the face, if you do, is not necessarily representing the same fraction as was found in the native wheat. So when you are measuring IgE, and IgE binds to that solid phase. 
Proteins that are water insoluble will have a lower concentration compared to water soluble proteins. Not a big issue. You just have to be aware of that. And that is why the component testing, when you that, add that, the omega-5 gliadin in particular, is so good in diagnostic markers because there you are sure that all your IgE can bind to the solid phase on omega-5 gliadin. If we look on the available components testing and serology testing on wheat, you can see it a little bit like the Russian Matroska dolls, where you have a doll in a doll in a doll. Because basically, these proteins can you can measure. Of course, you can measure total Ig, which is relevant irrelevant for many food allergens. But specific Ige basically covers all Ige that are able to find something recognizable in this box. There's also a, a specific Ige which binds only binds to gluten. We have a specific Ige that binds to the gliadin fraction, and we have this specific IgE to omega-5 gliadin, where I, which only recognize IgE that uh, bind IgE that recognize omega-5 gliadin. So you see that we have this where omega-5 gliadin is a part of the gliadin, which is part of the gluten, which is part of the uh, of the wheat. For many years, the, this food-dependent exercise-induced anaphylaxis and wheat-dependent exercise-induced anaphylaxis was a little bit uh, enigma and a dogma in the uh, clinic because we were not able to reproduce the by challenge. And one of the problems there was that the amount of allergen that was presented and administered in a challenge was simply too low. This was the common routine in many clinics when they did challenges on wheat-dependent exercise and tooth anaphylaxis. Treat slices of toast bread or similar to uh, 75 grams uh, of toast, 44 grams of wheat. But then back in 2015, there came a game-changing paper from the group in Munich in Germany. What they did was instead of using ordinary wheat flour, they replaced it with a concentrated, concentrated flute, uh, gluten flour. And thereby, they adding, instead of having those three slices of bread, they added what was equivalent to uh, 65 slices of toast bread, or more than 80 grams of gluten. So thereby, they were suddenly able to produce and elicit reactions in patients that was not able to elicit reactions with a lower amount of gluten or wheat. You can then ask, of course, how is this relevant? Is this physical relevant to eat 65 slices of toast bread? No, it's not. It's physiological unrelevant, but it's a proof of concept. And that is what this was about. What is gluten actually doing? Basically, gluten is trapping the carbon dioxide when the yeast uh, or when the dough is rising and maintain the structure. Gluten is water insoluble, meaning that you can basically take a, a piece of dough, put it under water, and what will remain there is the gluten fraction. So it's not something very suspicious or strange. It's a common product that has been used in baking for many years. Back to the German study. They actually found some very, very interesting part. What you see here is the 16 patients that they included. And you can see this is the dose that did not elicit reactions. So 10 grams of gluten or 20 grams of gluten with some of the cofactor aspirin, one, one um, grams of aspirin or 30 milliliters of alcohol did not elicit a reaction. But what they were able to do was that by adding cofactors, by adding aspirin, by adding alcohol, they could, in some of these patients, elicit reactions with the same amount of gluten. So actually, by adding cofactors, all of the patients were able to react. When they had cofactors, and some of them even reacted without cofactors, which is the proof of concept they were searching for. This led to a, a big extensive work, which I was part of. This is the diagnostic workup that we did in the clinic. We based the, uh, the di diagnosis on case history. We did skin prick testing, 
mainly because it's a great illustrative tool for the patient to see what are you allergic to, what, what, what can you react to. And then we, of course, included serology specific IgE to wheat and specific IgE to omega-5 gliadin. And then we did an oral challenge first without a classical titrated dose. And then we add exercise as well, as seen here. And you can see here that you have the titrated dose increasing amount of gluten. And before each dose of gluten, the patient had a treadmill exercise for 15 minutes. And this is not a reaction. This is simply the patient that are losing his balance. So what did the results show? Well, um, in those 38 patients that were tested, 19 of them reacted at, um, at rest with increasing doses of gluten. So this revealed that exercise is actually not mandatory for this wheat dependent exercise induced anaphylaxis. You see, there's a group up here that did not react even uh, with the high amount of gluten. But when adding exercise as a cofactor, all of these patients reacted. And you can see that all patients had a lower threshold compared to at rest. We also changed, uh, challenged them with aspirin to see how does that look in the picture. And you see the same picture. Aspirin also loading, uh, lowering the thresholds. Actually, we have a mean reduction of 88% compared to at rest, whereas exercise only reduced the, ex uh, the threshold with 62%. So how does this look on a schematic view? At rest, you can see you have some patients that are not reacting at rest and some patients where the, a high amount of gluten is enough to react. Adding exercise, we had a common reduction as mentioned as 62%. So tr threshold in these patients are now lower. Adding aspirin reduced even further. And if we combine those two, we had an even further reaction, a further lowering of the, the thresholds. So this is the picture that we would like to show. But as in all other cases, when you're working with biological systems, when you're working with individual, the picture is not as straightforward. This was what we actually saw. Some patients had a reaction as with an exercise. They could, were not able to elicit a reaction to when they had aspirin. And, but when we combined them, the threshold dropped even further. But at least it's a proof of concept how cofactors affect threshold in patients with wheat dependent exercise induced anaphylaxis. We also looked on alcohol due to ethical reasons. This was kept on a second trial, but there you can see we have a little bit similar. Alcohol does not seem to have the same strength in lowering the threshold. We only have a reduction of 40%, but still the same took place. All these patients had a lowering in the threshold. How does this uh, look on the serology? So here you have the patients, those patients who were positive at, uh, at rest and those patients who were negative at rest. And as you can see here, there's no difference in the uh, omega-5 gliadin levels. Whereas if you adding exercise, all those patients who had a positive omega-5 gliadin could elicit a reaction. That is also illustrated in the rock curve here that omega-5 gliadin is by far the best serological marker for wheat-dependent exercise-induced anaphylaxis. So the model for how they react looks like this. We have a patient that has an individual threshold here given as serum level gliadin. And if that patient only eats a certain amount of wheat allergens, you will not exceed the patient's threshold. But if you add, let's say, concentrated gluten, you might get above that threshold and you have a reaction. However, for another patient, the threshold must, is probably higher, which means that you need to add different threshold, different cofactors in order to elicit, elicit a reaction. But the take home message here is exercise and also the other cofactors like 
alcohol and aspirin are only facilitators. If you have enough allergen, those patients will react because they have IgE that recognize it. The big question, of course, is what is causing these? What is the mechanism behind these cofactors? Do we know anything about that? There has been proposed multiple hypotheses. This is uh, the recent study, again, from the German group, that's where they look into healthy individuals and challenge them and measure the serum gliandine level. And what they show was that serum gliandine level was not affected by any of these cofactors, proton pump inhibitors, aspirins, alcohol, and exercise in different uh, levels. All of them had more or less the same level of um, serum gliadine. The big question, of course, is this is healthy individuals. Is it because that allergic individuals behave differently? We don't know. This is something that will be looked into. So the diagnostic approach, how to deal with these patients on, um, with, with suspicion of food allergy and uh, cofactor induced food allergy looks like this. Basically starting with serology testing. IgE omega-5 gliadine is especially one to pay attention to if you have patients suspected to wheat dependent exercise induced anaphylaxis. And if, that, and if you have a positive serology test, do a food challenge. If it's positive, the patient has classical IgE-mediated food allergy. If the serology testing is negative, then we might have some uh, contradictory uh, diagnosis that could be uh, uh, that needs to be considered. We might need to do an exercise challenge here without any food to see if this is, let's say, culinary urticaria, runner's diarrhea, exercise-induced anaphylaxis. There are a lot of different differential, differential diagnoses in this group, which could be confirmed by this challenge. If the food challenge over here is negative, you might think about, let's do a, a food challenge with exercise as a cofactor. If the exercise challenge here is negative, we might need to add another elicitator to see whether it is cold urticaria or heat urticaria, these uh, physical urticaria, uh, physical induced urticaria that exists. And if the food challenge is positive here, we have food dependent exercise induced anaphylaxis. And then we end up with this group, the idiopathic anaphylaxis, basically those that we cannot explain by the current understanding. But if you go 10 years back, many of those patients that had food dependent exercise induced anaphylaxis would end up here. So I'm pretty sure if I'm giving this lecture in five years in the future, this group will be reduced even further because we gained some knowledge. What is the recommendation for these patients? How do we deal with them? Well, basically the current guidelines say that you need to have the classic anaphylactic emergency precaution. These patients needs to be equipped with an auto injector for adrenaline. And if they go outside somewhere, they need to have a cell phone and they need to inform relatives. Many of these patients have a high level of activity. I mean, that's how they found out that they have weak dependent exercise induced anaphylaxis. So go running or biking somewhere in the nature without a phone or without having informed relatives is not recommendable. Also, there are different, uh, depending on the case history, concerning recommendation in, in regards to wheat ingestion. Some of these patients, which might have a low uh, threshold and where exercise is not something that needs to be very high in order to elicit re reaction, there you need to uh, recommend total wheat avoidance. Others, and that is the majority of the group, you, you only uh, avoid wheat one, if four hours before and after wheat ingestion. This interval is also something that people are looking into. Can we narrow it down? Because it really makes a lot for the patient's well-being and, and quality of life. And there's this new study here, uh, which has been looked into the, uh, the effect of whether you should completely avoid uh, peanut, uh, sorry, wheat, or uh, uh, at least do some kind of introduction of wheat. And what they did was they, they um, separated the groups into a group that has complete avoidance of wheat and a group 
that consumpted wheat and only avoided it prior and after exercise. And then they have a challenge at baseline and a challenge after uh, seven weeks. And as you can see here, that group that was in the avoidance part all had a lowering in the threshold, meaning that even fewer amounts of wheat would elicit a reaction, whereas all those in the consumption group all had the same or an increased level. Of course, this is a small study, and many of those in the avoidance group were those who already had the total wheat avoidance because they were uh, having severe reactions uh, and had uh, uh, was put on total wheat avoidance due to these severe reactions. But still, it indicates that some kind of consumption is recommendable if possible. I'll just end up my presentation by showing this uh, case on how it looks in the clinic. This is a case history of a 49 year old male. He had more than 50 episodes over the last um, uh, eight, seven to eight years. Symptoms were fugicaria, few episodes in drop pressure, uh, drop, uh, blood pressure, and they were all related uh, uh, and all uh, in relation to physical exercise or after physical exercise. And he had one episode where he had alcohol. We did skin prick testing, mainly to illustrate for the patient what he was, uh, what, what we could see. So we had a positive wheat and some of the other cereals. These uh, here are some hydrolyzed wheat products because he was also included in a study looking on that. And we have the gliadine here. And here we have the gluten, concentrated gluten, both in a raw form and in a baked form. We also did um, serology testing on uh, the immunocap system with uh, wheat, positive wheat, positive rye, very positive uh, omega-5 gliadine, positive gliadine uh, fraction. Yes, he was uh, no uh, IgE to grass and to birch, which is a big problem normally in Northern Europe and also not to Mugworth. He had a negative challenge with the classical three uh, pieces of toast bread and combination with exercise. And after that, he actually had four new episodes and two of them actually with a drop in blood pressure where he was unconscious and ended on an in terms in intensive care unit. He then had a positive challenge where he did develop generalized due to carrier and that was at rest, no exercise here. He had 24 grams of gluten, which equivalents to um, 26 pieces of toast bread. And then we added exercise to the same and he had then developed uh, generalized urticaria, asthma, and, uh, uh, and he only had 7.2 grams of gluten. Sorry for the uh, misspelling. That is roughly nine pieces of toast bread. So this guy was clearly wheat dependent exercise induced anaphylaxis, and he was now put on the recommendation to avoid wheat prior and after exercise. So this is my final slide just to wrap up on this uh, interesting topic, at least in my opinion. Take home message for you is that wheat dependent exercise and dunafilaxis can be illicit without exercise and also without some of the other cofactors. Um, it does depend whether you have enough allergen, in this case, gluten, but be aware that cofactors such as aspirin and alcohol and probably also other cofactors can be involved as well. A positive omega-5 gliadin has the highest correlation to wheat-dependent exercise and anaphylaxis diagnosis. It is the best clinical marker we have. There are some suspicion that the other proteins than omega-5 gliadin might be involved in rare cases, but this is still something that people are looking, and as mentioned, it is rare. We also have some missing pieces here, especially on the mechanisms. What are the mechanisms driving these uh, uh, the absorption, are the different mechanisms between the different cofactors, is exercise and aspirin uh, uh, affecting differently on the absorption rate? Are the difference between allergens, I mean, this talk was on wheat, but what about shrimp and some of the other allergens we know? And treat treatment, what is best, total avoidance or slow re slowly reintroduction? These are also some of the questions that will be answered in the future, hopefully. So 
Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you have any questions, please reach out to my colleagues in uh, Thermo Fisher Scientific in uh, Mexico. Thank you very much.